Christina Ball, uh, our featured speaker tonight. Uh, Christina actually lives in Pinnacles National Park and she works there. And uh, you'll hear that Pinnacles is one of the homes of the uh, uh, Condor. Uh, so she has a, a, a up and close uh, view of them. Um, today, I also learned that uh, Pinnacles National Park is the home of the Townsend's Big Eared Bat. Um, so I don't know if Christina will, will mention the bat, but it, it sounded like a pretty cool bat. Um, a number of us, four of us, went on a recent trip to um, the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, and Christina was one of the guide guides. Janice went, I went, uh, Harley went, and David Norton. And um, so that's where we got to meet Christina, and, and I'm so glad that we did. Uh, she's uh, definitely knowledgeable about the birds. That goes without without saying. But it, you know, it was a pretty big group, and with varying degrees of ability, and also um, varying degrees of uh, physical capability. And Christina was one of those guides who she made sure that people saw the bird. Um, and helped people. And, and also she made sure people did it safely because uh, there were, I'm thinking uh, one particular terrain, um, which uh, was very, to me, looked very risky. And, and she stayed behind and made sure that everyone got down. So um, we appreciate that, Christina. And, and uh, that's the kind of guide that people sh uh, should be. Um, and one of the highlights of the um, the uh, trip, and there were many, uh, was a pre presentation which uh, Christina gave about her evolution as a birder and her evolution as an artist. And I, I think you'll hear about her art tonight and, and hopefully, uh, and I'm thinking and I'm hoping that she has uh, some art to show you. Um, and, uh, and during that talk, which was, not only informative and entertaining, it, it was very funny. And um, I, I, but during that talk, Janice, that's when Janice turned to me and said, we have to bring her to the Hampshire Bird Club. So, uh, and you know, Janice, she got right on it. Um, but um, in, uh, it's my understanding that one of her dreams in life is, is uh, to draw uh, over 10,000 birds. And I, I have no doubt she'll, she'll accomplish that dream. Um, I, uh, if you want a, some idea just how good her art is, go on amazon.com and there's a book, Turtle and Bird, uh, Spring. Uh, the, the turtle, it's a relationship between a box turtle and a song sparrow. But Christina did the illustrations and amazing, amazing in detail, just just amazing. So um, I actually ordered the book today when I saw it for my, my little grandnephew. Uh, so um, we're in for a treat. And so enjoy and thank you, Christina, for coming. And I look forward to this since I'm sure everybody else does. Right. Well, wow. Thank you, Elaine, for such a such a really nice uh, introduction. I am thrilled to be here today. Uh, you know, it was, we had such a great time in Texas. I'm glad you enjoyed that. And I have to say there's nothing like speaking to a, a crowd of people who want to hear about birds, uh, particularly a, a bird that historically hasn't always received a lot of love, uh, though today, you know, it's one of the emblems of of conservation. Janice is wearing uh, the perfect outfit for this. And just before we start, I wanted to show off my outfit I wore for this occasion. I've got condors on my pink condor necktie. I have my white wing patches and I have my tag number. So this is about as uh, dorky you can get for this kind of uh, presentation. So everything's ready to rock and roll. All right. So uh, Elaine mentioned that I live in Pinnacles National Park. Uh, even though I'm a New York native, currently I'm sitting in New York right now, and I'm really excited to be on uh, in the new uh, the northeastern part of the 
country, seeing all your great Northeastern birds uh, during the rest of the year, I do get to live in a pretty wild place. And most people have never heard of Pinnacles National Park since it's a very uh, new NPS site, uh, National Park Service site. So before I jump into my presentation, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea, ground you a little bit uh, in the location of this park and by extension, the location of the condors I get to live in. So can everybody see my, see my screen? Yes. All right, great. Yes. So here we've got uh, Pinnacles National Park, just to give you some uh, points that might help orient you. It's about two and a half hours south of San Francisco. It's about eh, an hour and a half east of Monterey. It's a very long way from Los Angeles between the traffic and the distance, it's at least five to six hours. But it's essentially in the Central Valley of California, uh, surrounded by the coasts on the east and big ranch lands all around. It's a very, very hot, arid, dry, rough place where the condors have decided uh, to make their home in this in this day and age. So I'll get into it a little bit more, but uh, it is also home to, as Elaine mentioned, the Townsend's big-eared bats. It's got endangered red-legged frogs. It's a really important uh, habitat for a lot of wildlife that might otherwise be uh, wiped out considering all the ranch lands that rose up around it. It's a little oasis for these uh, for these uh, creatures within all of that. All right, so now we're going to jump into the actual presentation. Here we go. So we're going to really focus tonight on these condors. Uh, like I said, truly one of the symbols of the conservation movement in the United States. You know, they were something that was almost wiped out completely. And at the 11th hour, humanity came in to bring them back. And I'm going to take you through some of that story tonight, as well as some other really interesting facts about condors that I've been lucky to learn uh, by watching them as a birder and by working with them in the park. All right, so con California condors are a very, very old bird. Their history goes back over two and a half million years. Uh, culturally speaking, they've been inspiring uh, people, especially native people, for thousands and thousands of years. Um, they're, they're definitely what we call a charismatic megafauna. Picturesque, iconic, People say they're ugly, but that ugliness is really just in the eye of the beholder. They're beautiful, majestic, epic birds with a story like no other. So the California condor is part of the family gymnogyps. Uh, and if you translate that from Greek and Latin, that comes to naked vulture, gyps being vulture, gymno being uh, bear and or naked, which is a very, uh, I think, boring description because it literally says what it is, like a song sparrow. Uh, but anyway, um, the California condor is one of the is the only remaining bird in the family Gymnogyps. They have discovered four others um, that used to exist thousands and thousands of years ago. The California condor was the only one uh, that survived after the end of the Pleistocene epoch a couple thousand years ago. And so at that time, uh, you know, the world looked very different. There were huge megafauna, giant sloths, mammoths lots and lots of food for the condors to eat. And you can see in this new picture from a mural that's actually in Albany, New York, uh, condors at one point, their range was so large, they would stretch all the way from Canada uh, down the West Coast and from all the way out in the West Coast, all the way up to New York and down to Florida. So their historic range was enormous, but that's because they had such an impressive food supply across the continent. Nowadays, you know, we don't have giant sloths and mastodons and mammoths walking around. So the condor's range is severely restricted, even besides all of the all of the uh, strains they have on their population from a from a, you know, humanity perspective, even without people, their main food source just disappeared. Uh, so the California condor survived the Pleistocene, made it into modern times. The rest of the gymnogyps birds uh, did not. Uh, and since then, you know, as the condor has lived alongside people, you know, it's an incredibly enormous bird. Uh, native peoples have been including the condor in their cultures and traditions for just as long as, as people in the condor have, have lived together. Uh, quite a few tribes feature the condor prominently in their mythology. And then the condor takes on quite a few roles, uh, depending on, on the native tribes. So there are the the Wyatt people who see the condor as a savior, uh, it actually brought back humanity after a great flood wiped them out. Whereas the Mono people have a story where the condor, the condor ripped off 
all the humans' heads uh, to try to tempt the squirrels to come. So that one's not quite so nice. Um, my One of my favorites, though, is the Yoka tell a uh, story of how the condor eats the moon occasionally to explain the lunar cycle. And then its wings are so enormous that they eclipse uh, they eclipse the sun. Uh, and then, of course, that, those enormous wing beats uh, feature prominently in stories of the Thunderbird, a bird whose wings uh, brought thunder and its eyes flash lightning. So Elaine mentioned I'm an artist, and this, based on um, some Native stories I read, was my interpretation uh, of that incredible, majestic Thunderbird coming out of the sky. All right, now... When people hear of California condors, it's usually because you're a birder and you know you gotta add that bird to your life list or because they've read about its incredible comeback story. Uh, from a conservation perspective, truly there is no greater effort in the United States that has been uh, so dire and so successful as that of the California condor. You know, a species that, that survived thousands of years, survived the end of the Pleistocene, survived even people, you know, by the time westward expansion was moving across the United States, uh, by the time the gold rush hit California, the condor's numbers were plummeting between lead poisoning, being shot, having their eggs collected, even some native uh, practices, you know, killing the birds for their feathers. All of these things uh, were really taking their toll on the population. And by 1987, we were down to 22 birds. And I like to think about that. I really like to think about that number. I'm sure there's just about 22 people perhaps in this meeting right now. It's hard for me to wrap my head around the idea that sitting here in this meeting, if I was a condor back in 1987, all of us here would be it for the species. Just unbelievable destruction. Fortunately, people decided to step in. There was huge controversy about whether the condor should be left to remain a wild bird or whether they should begin a captive breeding program. The proponents of the captive breeding program won. And in 1987, the last bird, Igor, AC, bird number AC9 uh, was taken out of the wild and the condor effectively became extinct uh, in the wild. And over the next few years, uh, captive breeding was able to keep the bird from plummeting into oblivion. Uh, I'll get a little bit more into that later, but luckily for us, just to summarize, you know, we had 22 birds back in 1987. By 2018, 488 birds now survived. So the condor was a bird that was literally ripped from extinction as it just as it was teetering there. It's quite incredible. Now, this is Igor, the bird I just mentioned, AC9, the very last truly wild condor. Um, back in 2018, he was still alive and well. But by 2020, when I, I Googled him, as a, I just really loved his story, I Googled him to see how he was doing. And unfortunately, his time had come. And he is, this is a picture of him, uh, Igor, the last truly wild condor uh, taxidermied so that others can learn his story. All right, so before we get into the specifics of California condor morphology. I just want to take a moment to place it within the context of the three vultures we have in North America. I'm sure up in Massachusetts where you all, you have your turkey vultures and your black vultures, um, which are fabulous birds. In my opinion, vultures are some of the best birds out there. They're all carrion eaters. Um, they all do such important work for the health of the planet. Um, but the condor uh, truly is unique amongst them. Uh, its range, as you can see, is severely, severely restricted. You know, it, was what, it used to cover that whole part of the continental United States. You can now only find in the, um, the western coast of California, the central part. Um, out there in Utah and Arizona, there are a small population. Baja, California is another release site where there's a small population. And I have to check and see, um, now there is a very small population up in the redwoods of Northern California, which we'll talk a little bit about more later. Um, it's only about eight birds, so I don't think it's actually on all of the condor range maps yet because it's still so precarious, but those four places are the only places in the world you can see wild condors, whereas you see the black vulture, turkey vulture, they're doing much better. All right, now, condors are enormous. They are the, the biggest wingspan of any bird in North America. On average, it's about nine and a half feet 
which if you can see on my little uh, graphic here, the turkey vulture comes in at around five feet. Uh, black vulture also comes in at around 5.3 feet. Um, it truly makes a difference. When you look at a condor and a turkey vulture together, and this is, a, we have an incredible um, raptor photographer in the park. He took this picture in Pinnacles. Uh, you can actually see these two birds were almost in the same line. Uh, and that is about the size difference between a turkey vulture and a condor. That condor could open its mouth pretty much and swallow that vulture hole, that little turkey vulture hole. You know, I used to think uh, turkey vultures were large birds. And now after seeing condors up close, when I see a turkey vulture, all I can think is, oh, you are so cute and little. Um, so, you know, being so close to these condors at Pinnacles has given me the opportunity to really, really uh, see the beautiful morphology and physiology of these birds up close. You know, like I said earlier, a lot of people think they're ugly. And I could say objectively, I see where you're coming from. But if you really look at this bird, look at that incredible coloration of the face, that gorgeous flaring red of the eye. I mean, they're really unique, pretty birds. And here's a here's a fabulous close up of that eye and all those wrinkles. Um, as you may know, like all vultures, they have those bare heads to help to make sure that, you know, when they are feeding on a carcass, uh, they're not going to get any meat or anything stuck in their feathers. It keeps them clean. Um, this actually is a pretty healthy condor, but there's often little bits of bacteria building up around the face. Um, if you've ever wondered what a condor face feels like, um, I can tell you from experience that it kind of, especially those puffy cheeks, like this one, Puff Daddy, that's his nickname. He has some pretty spectacular cheeks. Um, they feel like spongy pancakes. If you make pancakes in the morning and then you let them cool for a little bit and then eat them later, the cheeks feel just like that. Uh, pretty spectacular. And then you've got, of course, um, I've seen it on turkey vultures and black vultures a little bit. They have those neck feathers that they can raise and lower to help them uh, maintain a good body temperature. Uh, even in California, where it's really hot during the cool winter nights, those ruffs come up. And you can really see the ruff of the California condor is truly spectacular. The, there's a many, many, many small little pointy feathers um, that really bring out that rough that's used in breeding displays to keep it cool. Uh, and as you can see from these pictures, I just look at these condors and they just are majestic dinosaur looking things. I mean, looking at this, I really could not help but believe that birds come from Velociraptors or Tyrannosaurus Rex or something epic and fierce. Um, but the other thing I've learned from getting a chance to see these condors close up uh, you know, condors are actually more close, or condors, vultures as a family are actually more closely related to parrots than to other raptors. Um, and there are some of these things these condors do that really prove that while they may look majestic and fierce in certain situations, they are also giant goofballs. I don't even know, so hopefully you can sort of see what this is. That's a young condor's eye and its nostril on the left. This is a young condor nose booping the camera that it's found playfully just trying to figure out what it is. And now just to sort of reiterate the dorkiness of these birds alongside their, you know, majestic appearance. Here's a little video of a condor um, going back into the wild after it got a health check from some of the biologists and just look how gracefully it's gonna get off that cliff. All right, watch it, watch it. Looking around. And then do 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 boing boing boing. <laughs> uh, majestic beast. So while often condors do have put on these majestic displays where they'll will leap off the cliff and you know fly off into the sunset, um, they really are quite dorky. They have they're, they have special toes. Their their middle toe in the front, the free the three toe of the three toe, uh, three toes in front. The middle one is extra long, and their back one is quite weak. Uh, so similarly to storks, their feet are designed more for walking uh, than they are for gripping, like old world vultures. But when I look at a video like this, I, I think to myself, well, they still have a little bit of development to do because that walk was just really something else. Um, all right, so like parrots, uh, these condors are incredibly gregarious. 
when they find a source of food, they will all get together and they're just all going to want to be in on it. Like these, these condors have serious FOMO, fear of missing out, um, which actually can turn out to be very problematic when it comes to lead and other contaminants getting in their system. You know, when one of them has its chances are all the other condors in the area have also fed at that food source. So if there's lead from one condor, it's probably going to be in all the others. But we're going to talk about the, the lead and, and that situation a little bit later. But for now, um, just keep in mind that these condors love to be together. They even like to be together with other birds. Uh, they don't mind if ravens, turkey vultures, everybody might be feasting at a carcass. Um, and it's just one giant food fest. And, and these pictures taken here from these uh, from these cameras that the condor recovery program uses in pinnacles um, are from food sources that the biologists provide to the condors, um, not to have them acclimated to humans by any means, but they want to make sure that the condors always have a lead free source of food, regardless of what natural carry on is available in the area. As to, on top of that, knowing the condors knowing um, that there is food here means that they will come to these areas and when they need to be captured uh, for health checks to replace their tags uh, it's much easier to capture the condors when they're acclimated to coming for food here uh, though the biologists are very very stringent about making sure that the human condor interaction is very disparate you have to hide when you go up there you're really not supposed to be seen by the condors as much as possible there's a blind so that anything done with the condors you know people are not a part of it they do not want people and condors mixing all right now condors to continue the dorky condor theme condor love stories are just about one of the greatest things ever. So the males will do this insanely dorky move where they put their wings out like um, night where, uh, sorry, green tags are, oh, I forgot the green tag in the moment, but uh, that one with the zero there, he's lowering his head, walking on up, super gracefully dipping those big wings. And the female on the right, if she accepts his courtship, she will bow her head and do the same dance back. And I so wish I had a picture uh, to show you, but it's pretty, it's pretty hard to get a picture of both condors in the same frame when they're doing it. Um, this is actually that biologist who managed to climb up into the rocks high enough to get this great picture. Um, but truly the two of them mirroring each other, heads down, just bopping around is, is truly the next gr and greatest move for the dance floor that if you need something to spice up your party life, try that move right there. Um, so, a lot of people believe that condors mate for life. And while I think that's a lovely idea, and I would love that to be true from a romantic perspective, condor relationships are actually, they could have their own soap opera. Uh, you know, we've had condors in the park who have threesomes. Uh, we've had condors in the park who have multiple relationship pairings. We've had two female condors, two guy condors, where a female comes in, lays an egg, and then the guys raise it. Um, we have had this really dramatic instance where one condor laid an egg, um, another condor came in to try to mate with the condor who just laid the egg, the, the male mate kicked out that intruding bird. And then a few months later, when the biologist tested the DNA of the chick, neither the male condor who broke in or the male condor who pushed that condor out was the father. There was a third random condor somehow involved in the mix. Wild. And on top of that, recent uh, they recently discovered, you might have heard this in the news a few years ago, that condors actually can perform parthenogenesis. A condor chick was hatched without any biological male parent. So sky's the limit when it comes to condor family drama. So drama aside, um, once the two condors have, have paired up, mated, you know, all intrusive other birds aside if all goes well they will lay an egg that's on average four inches long uh this is my dog Aquila playing with a replica egg just to give you a, a little sense of scale you know if you know an average golden retriever size you know that is a pretty big egg if you hold your your thumb and your uh, forefinger out as wide as you can that's about as big um, as those eggs are it'll take about 60 days for those eggs to incubate and after that we get a fluff so I'm going to play this little video here. You can see my mouse. That little fluff is the baby condor. They're only about the size of your hand when they hatch. And that's the parent trying to fluff up its little uh, pom-pom right there. 
I can sort of hear a little chipping in the video. But yes, absolutely an adorable little pom-pom gray muffin. I, I want to take them home, um, but my partner says, no, we can't do that. They can't be couch cushions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for one moment just so I can show you a little link here. Um, what's really cool, if, you're, if you get really into condors after this talk, which I hope you do, there is a Cornell bird cam. I don't know if you've uh, seen those condor bird cams before on uh, the Cornell Lab website, but there is one on a condor nest. Now, right now, uh, it's the, the eggs, the condor eggs that um, so the biologists are studying haven't quite hatched yet. They're still even trying to see if they've been laid. Um, but this is the inside of a condor nest from last year. And if you go to this, if you go to this Cornell page in a few months, once the eggs have hatched, you can actually watch uh, the, the condors rear their chicks. And it's truly an incredible uh, thing to behold as that tiny little chick will go from the size of that pom-pom we watched uh, to a full-size condor in a matter of months. All right, so let's stop sharing this here. So that's just a little bit of info. So you can uh, really get sucked into condors even more. All right, let's sally forth. All right, watch that already. All right, so in about six months, after this pair, after diligent, diligent care from the parents. I mean, just like most birds, these condors work hard to raise that chick. In about six months, the condor will be full size and its head will be black like this. Condors, unfortunately, are one of those birds that take a long time to reach maturity. Five to six years before they have their full pink heads uh, and are sexually mature enough to lay their own eggs. Um, but even before they lay their own eggs, they're a lot of work. To the condor parents will take care of that chick for two years before they lay another egg. And while that is great in terms of making sure that that condor has a great shot at, at surviving in the wild, in terms of boosting a species population that's, you know, really needs that boost, you know, only laying an egg every two years means that the condor population grows really, really slowly, um, which is why every single bird counts. Um, unfortunately, you know, if you saw that little, if you were able to see that nest I showed you on the Cornell website, that's the average condor nest uh, of a condor in Pinnacles. In Pinnacles, it's a very rocky park. As you can see here, there's just rocks everywhere. Um, they will build their nest in a little rocky hole in the, in the cliff face. Um, and while that is a very protected spot from people and large animals, unfortunately, it's very susceptible to ravens in particular. That's a big issue. The ravens will come in. They will eat the eggs, eat the young chicks before they have a chance to fledge. Uh, sometimes the condors will try another egg, but last year we had a nest that, you know, within a few weeks, the nest was already done. Ravens ate the egg, the parents gave up, and we have to wait a whole other year for them to lay another egg. All right, so I was fortunate enough eight years ago uh, as a crazy young birder to begin my my adventure with the condors, so to speak. Uh, from a birder perspective, I won a little money in an art contest, uh, used it to buy a plane ticket to San Francisco, took about six buses with a backpack. You know, I was broke. I was 24 and an artist. Uh, got myself down to the nearest point I could in Big Sur, slept with a couple of raccoons, which my mother still can't believe I didn't get rabies from, uh, and then decided to walk down Pacific Highway 1, which aside from Pinnacle's uh, is a pretty good spot to try to look for wild condors. The pinnacles flock, uh, in pinnacles on a given day, we usually have about 20 birds, but the pinnacles flock is co-managed by Ventana Wildlife Society and is part of the larger Central California flock of about 90 birds today. So on any given day, there's often around 70 birds flying in and around, uh, you know, the rangelands around pinnacles and then out to the Monterey Big Sur coastline. So back in the day when I was young and broke and could not get to Pinnacles without renting a car, which I was too young to do. Taking that public transport down to Big Sur was the next best thing. And then uh, lo and behold, um, I learned as I walked onto the highway that walking down Big Sur is actually one of the stupidest things to do if you want to try to live a nice long life. There's lots of curves, lots of twists, but there were condors sitting in this tree on the side of the highway after raccoons and buses and not getting hit by cars and getting curled off the cliff's edge to die. I found two condors sitting in a sitting in one of those gray pines along the edge of Big Sur. And it was just this incredibly moving moment to realize that a creature that we'd almost wiped out and had a wild population of about 
I think it was like 240 back in 2016, two of them were sitting in a tree and I was watching them. And what was really great about this was that, you know, I was there with my binoculars being a truly overcome with emotion birder. You know, I'd read about their story. I got to add it to my life list. But there were all these other people going up and down Pacific Highway 1 who were definitely not birders, like no binoculars, no nothing. But they were getting out of their car and stopping and watching these birds. And it was just amazing to see how this incredible creature um, that we almost destroyed was now bringing all these people together. It was a very moving moment. Uh, so I painted it through some more art in here, inspired by the Yokut. A uh, story of how it could its wings could eclipse the sun, and to tell you the truth, as it flew beneath the midday sun, it definitely threw a shadow. And I can totally understand how all those stories came to be between its wing beats, its wing size. It was truly just an awe-inspiring bird. Uh, it became one of my favorite birds. I got a tattoo on my shoulder of it. So I could barely believe it when you know. Fast forward to 2021, my partner applied to be a condor crew lead at Pinnacles National Park and got the job. And to quote my mother, this is basically the birder version of a terribly scripted Hallmark story, isn't it? It's like, yeah, it really is. Me and my uh, ornithologist partner are now going to bounce off to live in a national park with my favorite bird. Couldn't have scripted that better. So this is a view of Pinnacles uh, or the high peaks of Pinnacles. As you can see, it's very rocky, very craggy. Um, and so, you know, I have to confess I'm not actually a biologist. I get to work with the condors uh, and work in pin pinnacles largely as a volunteer. Uh, but what's great about having your partner be uh, the ornithologist who's actually working is that I get all of the benefits with basically none of the responsibility. I don't have to do spreadsheets. I don't have to do with uh, bu uh, government bureaucracy. I just volunteer, go hang out with the condors, bring them dead cow steaks um, and get to see them really up close. And it's just absolutely amazing. So one of the things that we get to do is we get to make sure that they have a tag, that their tag is, is readable, that it doesn't need to be replaced. All wild condors at this point have a tag. Um, if there is a condor out there that, there that is untagged, that is only because it was unable to be uh, captured when it was in the nest to put a tag on it uh, and fled before that point. So at some point it will get a tag, but other than that, all wild birds are tagged, and that is so that biologists can easily recognize them. It is critical to know uh, which bird is which, because if we have to monitor it for lead poisoning or, you know, any other or figure out, you know, the relationships between the birds, which birds are nesting, which birds are not. And aside from that, from a birder perspective, or even just from somebody who enjoys watching wildlife, it's very interesting uh, because unlike other birds or other animals, which... You know, you might get to know, you know, in your backyard, you have a blue jay who likes to sit there and a cardinal who likes it over there. Having a tag means you can really get to know each individual condor in a more personal way. So this is one of my favorites on the left, 692. Uh, I personally like to call that one park pirate uh, because he really loves to steal people's hiking poles and just throw them over cliffs. You know, expensive ones. This is California. REI hiking poles, goodbye. Uh, so I think that's fantastic. Uh, condor tags all have a number and a color, and that color signifies what section of, of the numbers it is. So, for instance, purple tags are all 600 birds, so this bird would be 692. The one in my hand over there would be 650. There's a really great website called condorspotter.org where you can look for a condor's tag number by using the color, and you can learn all about the bird's age, name, and any other cool information, like whether they steal trekking poles, or we had this incredible bird who just died this year from lead poisoning named 602. Uh, he was known as Mr. Flirt because he flirted with literally anything that moved or didn't move. He flirted with trees, with rocks, with people, with other condors. Never, ever found a mate, that poor bird. But I hope in condor heaven he's flirting up there and finally found someone. All right, so this is my partner doing cool biologist things. Um, one of the things that happens on a daily basis is either park biologists or volunteers take this very old fashioned telemetry pole, go climb up into the high peaks as high as they can and use that pole to take signal sets. They're able to use the trackers on the condor's uh, wing tags. They have GPS trackers and radio trackers. 
uh, to keep track of all the condors, make sure all the condors are around. They go through every condor um, numerically. So they see, you know, okay, this condor's out there, this condor's a little bit closer, this condor's on the nest. And they do this on a daily basis so that if a condor's, you know, doesn't get a signal for a few days or the signal's not moving, um, or worst of all, if there's a mort signal, a death signal, they can immediately jump into action and track down the bird. So, you know, here's Aaron looking like a very, like hardcore park biologist. But what's really great about the condor program is that everyday volunteers can also do this too. So if you ever are on California and Pinnacles and want to do something as cool as this, they welcome volunteers to go out there and track those condors. Now, this is the part of Aaron's job that gives me a little bit of a heart attack, but the biologists also do a lot of rock climbing up and down those cliffs. Now, as you saw, those are some big rocks. And this is where I, again, am delighted to help with the condor program without being an official biologist because this kind of thing on the left, this rappelling down cliffs, which is about giving me a heart attack. But Erin and her other crew team, they will climb down cliffs into those condors nests. Um, at the earliest stages, you can see on the right, they're doing something called candling. Uh, they are using a light source to check on the health of the embryo within the egg. If it's a healthy egg, that's great. That's fantastic. They leave it. Um, if it's unfortunately, if the embryo has died, they will sometimes take the egg in the hopes that it will um, motivate the condors to try again. Like I said before, you know, the population grows so slowly that they need every available chance to have another bird uh, join the flock. Uh, so throughout the, the nesting season and the breeding season, the biologists take every great care to make sure they do not disturb the birds. Um, they will only really enter the nest to do health checks on the bird when it reaches the right age. Uh, they make sure one of the parents isn't there. It turns out the condors don't always mind the biologists going in. Um, that being said, there are some that definitely mind. Uh, one of the biologists got a piece of his face taken out once. Uh, they are very, very fierce birds when they want to be. All right, so aside from the work the biologists at Pinnacles do, the tracking, uh, nest monitoring, and just general, you know, taking care of the well-being of the birds and the chicks, there are still captive condor breeding programs located in places like San Diego. Um, they have the Raptor Center in Iowa. The Oakland Zoo, uh, just east of San Francisco, does a lot of veterinary help when the condors do have lead poisoning. They'll give them chelation to help remove that lead poisoning. Um, but just like in 1987, a lot of condors are still raised in captivity. Uh, and here's an example, that quintessential picture of, um, of a scientist using a condor puppet to rear the chick, which look at how, just how cute is that little fluffy muffin? I mean, look at that. And I will tell you, I've seen these puppets in real life. They are unbelievably realistic, right down to that spongy pancake face, te face texture. Um, and by doing this, uh, the captive breeding programs are able to usually get two eggs uh, you know, at least two chances for a chick from every condor pair, every breeding season. Uh, in Pinnacles, the numbers are much lower. You know, we have wild, real wild breeding condors. So there's, like I said earlier, there's all the risks um, associated with being in the wild. Ravens sometimes eat the eggs. Um, unfortunately, because the condor chicks grow so fast, uh, you know, within six months, they're full size. The parents need to be constantly feeding them what they'll often feed them is bone chips with lots of calcium so they can grow so, so quickly. But unfortunately, you know, lead is one of the biggest problems with the birds, the adult birds in particular, but the biggest uh, issue for immortality for the younger chicks is actually the consumption of plastics. A lot of the condor parents will unwittingly bring the condors back white or, you know, bone looking plastic instead of actual bone chips. And the chicks will consume all of that plastic and they'll just, you know, be dead before they're even out the door. Uh, you know, the in, the impact we have between litter and and lead, it's just really uh, takes its toll on these birds, which is why it's so great that you know we're still working so hard uh, to keep those numbers going up. All right, so now this is the part of the talk that gets a little bit more dreary because we're going to go into, you know, the biggest threats facing the condors, you know, more intensely. Um, in 2018, there were 488 birds. Um, when I called up Erin yesterday to ask her currently the number of wild birds, or not wild birds, of birds in total is 531 with about 300 so uh, wild birds. So that number has improved a little bit since uh, 2018, which is great. Um, however, 
you know, the number is still incredibly precarious. One really rough thing I learned when I started working with the birds, you know, despite all the th great things we hear about in terms of their numbers going up, uh, at any given time, you can assume that every single condor has some degree of lead poisoning. And that just really made me stop and take a moment to think about because it really made me realize that although we have returned so many of these birds to the wild, you know, really they are a population, they're a species that whose population cannot yet be sustained without human intervention. So then of course there's that argument, are they really wild condors or are they still really just, you know, like scientific creations? That aside, it just really blows my mind that, you know, if the, if the condor population, the condor recovery program were to lose funding, uh, the condors would probably just die out and, and all those birds would just, they just wouldn't be able to survive. The lead would just build up, build up, and that would be the end of it. Um, the only pop population that would stand a better chance is the one in Baja, Mexico, uh, because they just don't have the same access to lead that the birds do up uh, in the United States. Um, What's really unfortunate is that even though it's been proven that there are many kinds of lead shot that work just as well as lead, uh, California actually fully outlawed lead in 2019. And there are 15 other states that have partially or some or a fully outlawed lead, uh, lead shot. It's still really hard to control what people do on their own private lands. And unfortunately, right around Pinnacles National Park, there are still so many instances where lead shot has been used, the birds go eat there. And like I mentioned earlier, because they're so gregarious, we have these really traumatic die off events. Um, right at the beginning of 2023, four birds died from the same lead poisoning incident. They all ate it at the same carcass. They all got lead poison. They all died. That's a four birds may not sound like a lot, but in a population, especially in pinnacles where there's on average 20 birds a day, it's a huge, huge hit. Um, so, you know, lead is still the biggest issue. Biologists are constantly working to try to educate people, show them that it's not just not just condors, but so many creatures benefit from, from stopping the use of lead. You know, other raptors, even just, you know, if you think about hunting, if you eat something that you shot with lead, they did a study that showed that you are going to consume that lead. And so I think in terms of speaking to the public, you know, reaching out to those to those points like your children are eating lead, you're eating lead. Sometimes that's more effective than saying, you know, you're killing this ugly bird. Um, but what's really great is around Pinnacles, uh, the biologists, the park have worked really hard with the ranchers and a lot of the ranchers are on board and, and are actually proud of the condors that come with their ranch. They stop using shot, uh, you know, they report condors they find on their land to the biologists. So it really does give, give a lot of hope to everybody there that, you know, we can build these relationships and, and try to protect the birds, even as, you know, there are still some individuals who ruin it for everybody. Um, unfortunately in California, uh, the Pinnacles flock is a little different from this. There hasn't been a full blown fire in Pinnacles in years. We did have a small one last September, but unfortunately, you know, back, back a few years ago, they had all of those fires up and down Big Sur. Which is where, which is where the other part of the Central California flock uh, lives and breeds, and you know the most famous bird from that fire. This is um, 1031 Aniko on the right. She was caught in a tree that was burning down. Her nest was burning around her. Uh, I believe the the male bird did not make it. The, one of them survived, and actually, uh, my um, my partner worked with the biologist who went to get Aniko out of the tree after the fires had stopped and she survived. And I think Aniko is this really incredible uh, survival story. I've actually seen her in Pinnacle. She's now free flying, she's independent, she made it. But that was an incident where, you know, many condor nests were destroyed. Many, many uh, condors were injured, some died. Their, their habitat was, you know, decimated. Um, and that's a everyday threat in California where the drought and the risk of fire is always, always there. Um, and then of course, you may have heard last year, the biggest threat on the horizon beside lead is that avian flu, uh, avian influenza actually wiped out 20 condors in a month uh, down in the Arizona flock. And that was one sixth of their whole population down there in one month. So in California, uh, they believe they believe that the avian flu is spread by water, which in California is actually 
that drought finally was a good thing. Over the summer, all the biologists spent the summer preparing for what could be condor COVID. Um, they made isolation pens. They're moving on to seeing how the uh, emergency vaccine for avian influenza will work. So just everyone keep your fingers crossed that the virus just never comes to the California flock because we don't wanna have condor COVID in a species that only has 531 individuals. Um, I just wanna add uh, before the end, there's one, there's always good things to talk about too. We talked about the rough stuff, but uh, back in 2022, we had this great example of how the condors are continuing to return uh, to their ancestral home. The Yurok tribe of the Redwoods, you might have heard, uh, finally were able to bring the condor back to their uh, cultural homeland, the condor's ancestral homeland. Uh, and back in May of 2022, six condors were released into the Redwoods. Um, and now that number is getting bigger. They're continuing to release more birds. It is a very difficult thing to create a new condor flock just because the resources required to do so are enormous. You have to have constant monitoring. Biologists have to be able to work there. You have to have, you know, everyone around the public, uh, people who live there working to, you know, make sure these birds are okay. Um, but fortunately, the Yurok worked really hard to bring these birds back. Um, you know, hopefully in the future, other other tribes, other places can emulate this, but for the time being, just we're gonna hope that that redwood flock continues to grow and thrive and provide an example for other um, other areas to have the condor return. All right, so, you know, in Massachusetts, in New York and the East Coast, we don't have condors, uh, but I think we, there's a lot we can still do just in terms of understanding the condor situation, uh, sharing it with other people. And just, you know, there are other raptors here too, uh, just understanding the danger of lead shot across the board, no matter where you are, like I mentioned earlier, it affects all aspects of living things, whether it's you using the shot or, or the creatures eating the shot animal. Um, you know, the, all that plastic, it affects the baby condors, it affects all living things, it affects us. I don't know if you've seen that terrible movie with the albatross getting the albatross's stomach just filled with plastic, the oceans. Um, you know, really the less we can litter, the less plastic out there in the world, that's really gonna make an impact on, on condors and all birds. And then even something as simple as driving safely, you know, a lot of birds, raptors are hit, um, are hit as they try to eat that roadkill along the road. In California, I see always constantly turkey vultures eating roadkill pigs, roadkill deer, but the condors sit there too. So it might be, it might sound so simple, but just, knowing that these birds are there cleaning up after us and just giving them some space can make a big difference. So, you know, the Thunderbird, the California condor has returned to California. It's returned to Arizona. It's continuing to spread back to where it once lived. Uh, it's, its existence is still precarious, don't get me wrong. Uh, I think it's important that we all realize that it's not just smooth sailing and a happy ending for this bird without the continued support of the public, of, you know, birders are a great way uh, to spread information about this bird. And hopefully, you know, humanity can keep pushing to restore not only the condor, but all the other, you know, creatures that whose populations we've ruined. The whooping crane is another great example. Um, you know, it's, it's up to us really to make sure that the birds like the California condor continue to soar free above uh, the pinnacles of California. So, you know, I hope that all of you have learned something from this presentation that it motivates you to go out and look for condors and look for vultures. If you're ever in pinnacles, um, I'll be there for a while. So you can come, uh, I'll come show you some condors. All right. I think now we have time for a couple of questions, right? Yes, we do. Thank you so much, Christina. Way more than I ever thought about condors. And uh, I plan to be out there in pinnacles, hopefully in January. Um, questions, questions, um, what I would suggest is, uh, if you unmute your mic and feel free to go ahead and ask Christina your question or type it in the chat box and we'll rephrase it. Uh, we have one comment from Joel saying, Christina, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Very Any much. questions? Uh, Christina, uh, does your partner regularly undergo mental health checks? Because I think she should. <laughs> well, let me tell you, as soon as this presentation is over, she's going to hear about that. That's, <laughs> um, that's great. So 
I, you know, I mean, I'm there to help with the mental health. I think, I think that kind of work does take its toll on you. For instance, when that Mr. Flirt, when 602 died, Aaron was very, very down. The whole, the whole team was down. I think there was crying at the meeting where they had to talk about it. You know, when all, all those birds died at once, you know, it can really be rough working in this job. And then of course there are rough moments like when there was one time she uh, was trying to even just bring it a carcass and the gate was locked and they had no key and they ended up dropping the carcass on themselves as they tried to lift it up and over the fence. I mean, there are great moments like that, that, I mean, my sister, if that had happened to her would have had just had a heart attack on the spot. Um, but there are really beautiful moments too, such as when a chick fledges or you even get to just hold a bird up close and know that you're helping keep it alive. So I think, well, maybe health checks are a great idea. Mental health checks are a great idea. We'll, we can talk about that. Um, I think the good, like knowing that you're really contributing to the survival of a species uh, really keeps you motivated uh, when, when things get really bad. I mean, sometimes I think about the fact that Aaron goes off to work every day and and is crucial to the survival of this endangered species. Like if she'd stayed home that day, who knows what could have happened? Um, that chick that was at the San Diego Zoo is being uh, uh, taken care of by a puppet, that looked really prehistoric. That chick, oh mm -hmm. God help me. <laughs> yeah, it really, really proves to you that this is an ancient, ancient species yeah. through dinosaurs. Uh, to, to what extent are these uh, condors finding uh, food on their own or in the absence of those large uh, creatures from the Pleistocene times? Do they Are they somewhat dependent on being provided with cow carcasses by um, biologists? That's a great question. So, you know, when we think about the historic range of the condor versus its range today, realistically, it could never really go back to its full range because it does not have the food source, especially if you think about the Northeast, we might have some deer as roadkill, but there's just really not enough big megafauna to sustain the population the way it used to be. That being said, in this day and age, uh, they've learned beggars can't be choosers, so they will eat smaller things like ground squirrels or, or other smaller uh, carcasses if they find it. Um, and, and they are very good at finding their own food. Like there's definitely enough food around, especially in terms of, you know, feral pigs, deer, there's elk in California in some places, the coastal birds might find a whale carcass or a seal carcass. Um, there's definitely enough food around. The issue is in this day and age, so much of its food supply is contaminated in some way. You know, if it's not the lead, uh, it could be the plastic. A lot of marine mammals just have so much plastic, um, as well as other chemicals, mercury, that it's not a question necessarily of whether they can find the food, it's whether the food is going to just make them sick. If that if that answers your question. Okay. Christina, there is a question in the box. Uh, Gail, do you want to unmute your mic and ask your question? I can, if you don't want to unmute. Right. Yeah, I got it. Um, we live in northwestern Arizona now and would like to go see the condors at the Navajo Bridge. What time of year do they usually arrive and when do they nest? All right, great question. And I definitely recommend going to see them. I've seen them there too. It is spectacular watching the sun come up on that bridge and seeing the condors stretch awake. Um, so I will confess, I do not necessarily know the exact uh, breeding schedule of the Arizona condors vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, Cal the California California condors. Um, I will, if you'd like, I can, if this is possible, I can actually look that up for you. I'll ask Erin uh, and she'll talk to her condor people and I can get that information to you somehow if that, if there's a way we can facilitate that. Uh, but I will say it, it's probably very similar to the ones over in Pinnacles because the, the weather is all very similar out there. Um, they don't migrate. They will always be at the bridge. So, you know, at any time of year when you go to Arizona, when you go to the Navajo Bridge, uh, there will be condors there. Um, that being said, from my understanding, a lot of the condors that died from the avian influenza were the ones that frequented the bridge. So I heard a lot of people uh, talking about how when they went to the Navajo Bridge last year, they missed the condors. And while there are many other condors, and so I don't 
exactly know how if this is the same situation nowadays. Uh, I think that affected their visibility then. Hopefully other birds have come to fill that void. Um, I will say in terms of the breeding season, based on what I know from the Pinnacles birds, January is when they start doing their fabulous little display dances. Um, and by now, uh, they've had their nests picked out. And Erin actually went on a uh, nest search today to see if they're, if the nest is active, if it's got an egg. Uh, usually by May, uh, the condors have hatched. So that that uh, timeline there uh, sort of represents the, the Pinnacles birds. By August, they're usually getting ready to fledge, August, September. And I see your email there, so I'll try to get that info for you. Use all of my condor contacts. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much and very wonderful, informative program. I'm glad you liked it. All right. Any other questions? Anyone else? Um, I have a, yeah. a quick question. Go for it. Yeah. Um, I love your artwork. So do you have a website or any any information that you give us where we can look at your artwork some more? Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, I actually do. I have a website and I think I can just drop it. I will drop the uh, link in the chat here. Wonderful. Thank you. I hope you enjoy. Oops. There we go. Drawing10,000birds.com. No. And if you go quick, it's still on. Uh, it's in the announcement about her presentation tonight, the, the link to it. But I think that is going to rotate off by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Drawing10,000birds.com. And there should be a section in my website where you can contact me. And, and I am serious. If you do come to Pinnacles, you know, I, I do work and Erin and works. But if you come to Pin Pinnacles, email me. And if possible, I'd be happy to take you out. Like Elaine was saying, I'm a guide. I can't officially guide for you in Pinnacles because of the legalities of that. But I'd be happy to take you out as a friend and try to find you some condors if I'm, if I'm not working that day. Or, or you could just volunteer to go out if you arrange it ahead of time and you're really committed, uh, we can try to see if you can go out and volunteer with Erin and get to use the really cool uh, telemetry stick. Christina, do you want to share your email that you want them to contact you? Yes. In the... That's a great idea. So just in case you don't want to deal with having to go through my website, here is my email right here. Drawing10,000birds at gmail.com. Oh. So how many of us are thinking of going? Everybody. <laughs> Club field trip. How many volunteers do you get, Christina? That's a great question. Uh, so, you know, on a general basis, I believe there are about eight volunteers who hardcore, who hardcore volunteer on a weekly basis. Um, and then, you know, I've had friends come to visit uh, and they volunteered for a day or two just because, you know, I knew them could vouch for them and and they just want to do something simple like, you know, go help track the condors. Um, doing steak dinners is usually something that takes uh, a little bit more of a commitment to get into. But if you live out there, it's a lot easier. <laughs> Christina, describe. I remember you mentioning in Texas how you carry the car take the carcass. I mean, are, they, are we talking to like a, a Hereford, a Holstein, a full cow? Okay, that's great to clarify. So I do not have that kind of muscle capacity. So thank goodness we're talking about very young calves. Um, okay. The, the, the Condor program has partners has partnerships with a lot of local dairies who donate their stillborn calves. Uh, so while well, they seem very heavy because artists aren't exact, well, I'm not bulking up all the time, um, they're definitely... You can definitely lift them with two people. Okay. Yeah. And how often do you do that? This is done about twice, in general, about twice yeah. a week. Same place, twice. different place? Twice a uh, what? Tw uh, twice a week. Oh, okay. Uh, it doesn't, sometimes it changes depending on uh, breeding. Uh, though usually, though usually it's, it's twice a week. And I think one thing that would affect it is if avian flu came to yeah, our yeah, yeah. To majorly modify that schedule so that we didn't have that we don't want the birds to congregate we want them far far away but for now twice a week 
And I'm sorry, I forget the other question. It was, it was what, how many times a week? And yeah, I'm sorry. I completely forgot the second question. I think, yeah. I think it was, was it in the same place? Ah, there's a couple of different locations depending on what they're trying to do. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? This is your chance, you know, this is uh, I think you under asked, communication is going on now. I think you actually said this, Christina, which is that they never will now be self-sustaining. It will never be possible because uh, the, 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 the food that they could ever find on their own naturally will kill them. Yes, unfortunately, and I, not every, not every carcass, thankfully, has lead in it. There are, a lot of them do not. Unfortunately, until lead is completely banned uh, and no longer is leaching into the ecosystem in some way, there's always going to be that very likely variable that a condor, the condor is going to find that particular carcass and, and they're going to ingest that lead. And it's still so frequent that even if they ate, you know, 100 carcasses without lead, you know, it takes, a, it takes a grain, less than a grain of rice of lead to poison a condor. So all it takes is that one outlier to just wreak havoc on the system and there's so many times that can happen before you know it all falls to pieces but there's hope you know it could happen one day we might get to a point where we just don't use lead bullets anymore i think that would just you know that that will be the game changer in terms of condor recovery in my opinion so is the lead shot a problem also with other threat um raptors or uh Vultures? That's a great question. So the, it, the digestive juices of a California condor are significantly stronger than that of say a turkey vulture. So as part of that digestive process, the lead, the lead affects them much more potently than other birds. They've done research where they've found that a turkey vulture or another raptor, another smaller raptor that ingests lead is just not as affected as badly. That being said, they've also done studies that show that the removal of lead definitely positively impacts uh, the populations of birds like turkey vultures, golden eagle, um, you know, other raptors that are in the area. Um, but it just it doesn't seem to affect them as as critically, which is which is good or else we'd have to deal with the plummeting populations of all these raptors. But, yeah, it definitely affects them, too, on some level. And the lead is lead shot, and so it's like at a level that you can see it. Like, I have seen X-rays from the from the Oakland Zoo of you know again these tiny tiny grains of lead, so small that you barely even know it's there, but you can see it, and that is enough to be making the condor sick. Okay. Um. If there are no more questions, we'll call it a wrap. Uh, Christina, there are a couple comments for you mm -hmm. in the chat box. Uh, one from Janice Sepko. She's from a neighboring uh, club. Uh, what an adventure. Thank you for sharing your enthusiasm and great knowledge with us. Uh, Laura Beltran said, thanks so much. This was really, really great. And uh, and then you added your, your comments. But this was fabulous, fabulous. Um, for all of thanks. you we will it's recorded it should go up in about four days on our video website from the at the hampshire bird club christine i'll show you i'll send you the link when when we get it up yeah and you can join youtube and it'll be on youtube you can um subscribe to the hampshire bird club site All right thank you for that info so thank you very much christine it was fab fab yeah. good okay well, thank you so much for having me